Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 9N, where we're going to talk about plant breeding. Um, in this case, conventional plant breeding, not genetically modified organism breeding. We'll talk about the factors that have to be considered before undertaking a breeding program, about how breeding programs work, the um, costs of them, and the ultimate test, is the new strain marketable? So with plant breeding, there's an awful lot of issues to consider before you even start. For instance, you have to know the generation time. Is this an organism that reproduces in weeks? Like maybe you're really lucky in breeding radishes. Or are you working with trees that may take decades to even reach reproductive maturity? What kind of resources do you have for breeding? Will you need a greenhouse? Will you need a forest? Um, how big is your breeding population going to be? And what strain or strains are you going to use? Very important is the question of whether there's high enough heritability for the traits that you want, and is there enough genetic variation in your population, or has the variation actually been exhausted by previous rounds of breeding and selection? And will the plants then need to be mutagenized to create new variation, or perhaps you should cross them with wild varieties to bring in new alleles that are missing from the um, cultivated populations. If you need new genetic variation, one solution is to carry out mutagenesis. And this is a photograph, of a Google Earth image, of something called the Gamma Field Irradiation Garden. It's at the Institute of Radiation Breeding in Japan, and it's a place where plants can be subject to mutagenic radiation to promote um, DNA synthesis errors and repair errors that will create genetic variation that can then be used to, in breeding programs to select new varieties. The way it works is that buried in the center here is a cobalt source that produces 88.8 .8 terabecquerels. You don't need to know what these units means. That's a lot. And when this source is raised up out of its deep burial chamber where it's normally kept, it floods the whole garden with radiation at doses that are very, very high here in the center and that get weaker as plants are grown farther and farther away. So it's possible to subject plants to a wide range of doses of variation in one experiment. And these plants can be subject to radiation throughout their entire growing period, particularly when they're developing their seeds and when they're going through meiosis, to generate a lot of genetic variation for a breeding program. There's still a lot more issues. How severely are you going to select for the desired phenotype? Remember that selection risks creating inbreeding, and it also eliminates the genetic variation you might be looking for. How many generations will you do? And how big an improvement do you need? Is the trait multigenic? Is it controlled by more than one gene? If so, you're going to need more genetic variation. Most importantly, who's going to pay the costs of the breeding program? Um, strong selection, um, few generations, small improvements. Those things reduce the cost of the program, but they also decrease the likelihood that it's going to succeed. And the generation time matters a lot but it, because it determines how long your selection breeding program is going to have to go on. This is why many long-term breeding programs are sponsored by governments. They're the only ones who can invest the long-view resources to keep a program going for a long time. Even once you have your new phenotype, you have to test it under field conditions, the conditions that your growers are going to be using. And most importantly, you have to test whether it's really marketable. Does it grow well enough? Does it yield large enough crops? Does it have enough attractive properties that you can sell it? The one thing that you usually don't have to do is safety testing. Hey, it's natural. Why worry? Of course it's safe. 
This, of course, is not a guarantee. Lots of natural things are quite lots of natural plants are quite toxic, but in the case of conventionally bred plants, any safety problems, any toxicity or allergens or anything, are usually only discovered long after the plant has been brought to market and is being widely consumed. So I'm just going to discuss one example, and that's the Green Revolution brought about by Norman Borlaug's breeding of wheat. He set out to create strains of wheat initially that were resistant to a rust fungus, and he did this by crossing in genes from Mexican strains. He took the high-yielding North American strains, Canada and U.S. strains, and crossed in alleles from Mexican strains that conferred resistance to rust. And then he selected for another trait, which was day length tolerance, because growing wheat in Canada and the US, you could only grow one crop a year, and it was very sensitive to the day length. That's how many plants decide when to undergo meiosis and produce their seeds. But he selected for plants that could tolerate a lot of variation in day length by selecting for successful growth with plants that he grew both in Mexico and in Hawaii. So he got strains that would tolerate different day lengths and could be grown all over the world. And finally, tall wheat strains, normal wheat strains, didn't benefit very much from being fertilized because it made them grow taller and then they just fell over and couldn't be harvested. So instead he bred in genes from a Japanese dwarf strain that didn't grow very tall but had very strong stems. And not only could he fertilize these plants without them falling over, but the yields were actually higher because the plants didn't waste resources synthesizing long stems. He spent 16 years doing these crosses and selecting the new strains in Mexico. And you can see the results in this graph. So these are the 16 years of his work in Mexico, and you can see that Mexican wheat yields were going up and up and up during this time. And then the wheat strains began to be adopted in um, southern Asia, in India and Pakistan. And now we see that not only are the Mexican yields continuing to go up with ongoing improvements, but now the yields in India and Pakistan are going up too because they're using his new improved strains. So we've considered conventional plant breeding. We've talked a bit about the amount of time and work it takes, a great amount of planning, the enormous amount of resources that have to be invested. Um, usually there's no testing of DNA variation with concerns for, well, we don't know what these genes do. Variation is tested only with a view to being able to predict how successful the breeding program will be. There's almost, there's testing for marketability, but almost no testing for safety. And there's very little public concern about conventionally bred plants. Coming up next, we're going to contrast conventionally bred plants with genetically modified plants, um, genetically engineered plants. I hope to see you there.